Over the last few decades in South Africa, an increase in black students entering higher education institutions has meant that universities, historically set up for a minority elite as part of the apartheid system, have had to deal with the multiple needs and challenges that students who were previously shut out bring. In an attempt to find solutions to some of South Africa's higher education institutional challenges, the Human Sciences Research Council embarked on a mission to track student experiences at eight universities across the country over five years in order to investigate the factors that contribute to their success or failure and the individual and structural tools needed to navigate university. We ask young people exactly what encourages self-determination and facilitates success in university. Is it entirely up to the students or does their experience of the institution also make a difference? We look at students' experiences of accessing, starting, staying in, passing through, dropping out, gap years, swapping, returning, finishing, graduating and working. Like Olwe Tulukodlo from King Williamstown, who started by doing a law degree at the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University, but dropped out after two years because she discovered that law was not what she wanted. She couldn't get into the institutional culture of the university and failed in her second year. She took a gap year to recover from the disappointment and then registered for a Bachelor of Social Science at the University of Forte, where she completed her degree. The unfortunate part of us as black students more predominantly that we carry the dreams of our parents, you know, so going back home and quitting would, would have crushed him. Um, quitting in third year crushed him. The modules that I'd failed disappointed him, but... Or Henry Muchenje from Prakpan Ekuruleni, whose first choice was chemical engineering at the University of Pretoria. But after intimidation from administrative structures, struggles with the application process, and feeling as though he wasn't welcome at the University of Pretoria, found refuge at the University of Johannesburg, where he is currently completing the fourth year of his mechanical engineering degree. He sees I'm black and he's addressing me in Afrikaans and I'm answering him in English. So the attitude, right, they just told me that, you know what, this place is not for me. But I always wonder, you know, what could have been if I had stayed at UP, you know, career parks and whatever. We meet Mtata Bred Elihle Pumani, who began her university journey at Cape Peninsula University of Technology, where applying late resulted in her doing two years of events management, a degree she was assigned and one she didn't choose. After being academically excluded, Elihle eventually took a gap year in 2015 to regroup. In 2016, she enrolled at the University of Johannesburg. I had to make peace, like as much as it was totally different from what I wanted, um, it's not like I had much of a choice. And like I said, it was actually quite a nice course. I enjoyed it. We also talked to Masejo Manatoko from Dobsonville Soweto, who is currently doing her honors in property evaluation and management at the University of Johannesburg after completing her undergrad in BCom Finance at the same university. Although her first choice was VITS, Masejo ended up at UJ and has never looked back. Never stumbling too hard off her path and maintaining a steady course to graduation, Masejo will be starting an internship in March as she completes her honors. With me, I graduated, I'm doing my postgrad, and I got an internship opportunity. It's a happy ending. I'm happy, everyone is happy. These are stories of journey and what it means to tread lightly, trudge, trek, slog through the sometimes rough terrain of higher education, forging a path and a passage through life picking up lessons and enjoying the scenery along the way. Who better to tell us more about these journeys than the students themselves? Um, for me, going to university means a chance to upgrade my mind, change society and become a better individual as well. Starting a whole new chapter in your life, almost like a rite of passage. It was the bridge between the, the ideal job and um, the, the existing conditions. It demonstrates perseverance and determination to achieve goals. Experiencing um, different cultures and, and growing as a person. It's like uh, an investment for my future. An opportunity to 
uh, meet my goals. It's going to assist a lot of people. I could one day provide for my little brother and even maybe my family. A bit of relief for my family and basically it was also a measure of, of success. First year is a major transitional period for students as they are moving towards greater responsibility for their own lives, which can include living away from family, managing finances, balancing workload and having to make new friends. It is also an environment that presents many choices about behavior, including sexual choices, drug and alcohol use, which may also contribute to a stressful experience. On top of these changing social and psychological demands, the academic and physical environment can also be intimidating. I chose engineering because I love to work with mechanics and I love creating my own stuff. Yes, I was positive about law because I always wanted to help the community. To actually advocate for people, to advocate for things that I believe in. I wanted to study psychology, I wanted to do law, I wanted human resources. But now that I am doing tourism, I think that after I'm done with my tourism diploma, I want to go uh, study to become a flight attendant. I wanted to do psychology. But then it was full when I got there and then I received an SMS that I'll be studying population and development studies. I wanted to do education, but uh, since well, uh, my, my aunt is someone who knows me better. She, she knows that I've got reasoning capacity and she told me that uh, LLB can be my degree. So since I've started LLB, I have noticed that I was maybe going to choose a wrong degree. My first choice was graphic design and she told me I should do something or look for newspapers and check the workplace to see what jobs they offer and then she kind of forced me to do it. When you start choosing subjects in high school, that's why I think the information needs to be fed in. They don't really do a self-introspection, what, what am I good at? Remember we are not all advantaged. Like I said, there are others who come from the deep rural areas and from, you know, places where they, they, they struggle to get access to information. Some people are also forced to be things because of their family's opinion on certain careers and the financial stability of certain careers. Uh, due to pressure at home, with my family pushing me towards doing psychology because in there was a more stable environment. So eventually I caved in and I did psychology. Um, my idea about university, honestly, it was like the American Pie movies. Maybe because I watched too many movies, I expected DUT to be really big and I would get lost. And when I got there, it looked smaller than my high school. You know, it's a lot of partying, drinking, fun. Expecting anything to happen, like I was just open-minded. It's totally different to high school where we were spoon fed. I know that I was passing very well. Even if I didn't study, I was going to pass. I could just study the week before for my physics exam and get 98%. I thought that I'm going to graduate using the same method that I was using at Seconda. So that perception was totally wrong. Um, my registration process was actually really smooth, eh? Because when I registered, it was still few of us. Okay, there are long queues, obviously, but then they are organized. It was quite a long wait, especially for first years. There's a lot of waiting. My registration at NMMU went so smoothly. It was done in 45 minutes. I had everything. I had a student card, I had everything. There are keys, but not so long. At Forte, it took me three days to register. I went day one in a queue. Things are offline. Day two, things are offline. Day three, things are offline for the morning. They online for the afternoon, but it's lunchtime. They need to go. The fact that you come in early doesn't stop them from coming in late. You know, that kind of thing. And then the queue just spoke. There are people to show you this is what you do if you want to register. This is what you do if you want to add a module. There's lines running throughout the campus. So you wait in those lines. And when you get to the end, they're like, no, you're in the wrong line, just go somewhere else. Secondly, they employ students to facilitate administration in terms of registering. Last year, when we started our registration, we had a problem with electricity, which was beyond our control. So we had no electricity for like the whole month. You go on a different time of the day, and then Pinduye on the same window, they'll tell you a different thing. I feel like the system could go a bit faster if things were 
less paper bound and more online? Because the registration is easy. You just go online and, and, and register. They let us register online, so we have like different stations. Some of us, uh, where we come from, there are no internet cafes. A lot of people, they don't know about them. So if they can encourage more students, like especially first years. If you need an internet cafe, you must just go to town. So going to town is like going to that university. Right next to a food place, there's a bar there, and students are just outside, some are smoking weed and stuff like that, and you're like, this is supposed to be an educational institution. Can't they do something about this? I read on their website that the classes are presented in English and in Afrikaans. When I got here and I go to the lecture hall, the class is presented in Afrikaans. I have to put headsets on in order for me to actually hear what is being presented in class. My first positive impression was the infrastructure. The computer labs, the lecture venues, you know, the parking spaces, the library, the infrastructure is just amazing. I will get to meet new people. The thought of just being a university student was like, yeah man, I'm, I'm, I'm halfway there to getting a qualification and graduating. Orientation was, there was no point to it because it didn't prepare me academically and mentally to what I was going to face. You, you get to learn a lot of things about where libraries are, where the student centre is. It was more like a, an advertisement of the university and not like a preparation of, of like a soldier going to war. We we're able to be familiar with the environment as well as the classes that we're going to attend. I want to get given a clear timetable, not fill in, go slot A, no slot B. You know, like this is university now, so for every hour of lecture you get, maybe two hours of self-study, instead of having to figure it out halfway through the semester by yourself. You know, more stuff to do with academics. And how can you find books in your library? Online resources, how to do referencing according to university standards. I got to meet my fellow students. I got to know the campus. I got to meet my lecturers, get my timetable. Up till recently, I found out about places I didn't know existed, yet my friends that did go to orientation already knew about. So I feel like it fills you in and you know what services there are, what services you can use. It's really, really multicultural. It is very safe. I felt at home when I got to the place. The people there are nice. On campus, it's amazing. It's amazing, everyone interacts with each other. The security is tight, the security is, is excellent. But once you get out of campus, the university doesn't care anymore. The crime usually happened like around bashes, where there was freshers bash, where there was Mr. and Mrs. something. Lectures finish late at quarter to seven. They are credit accommodations which are just across the street from the university. And there's no any form of security between that road and the accredited accommodation. It's this basis of every man for himself kind of thing. If they're working hand in hand with the community policing forum, they can do a lot of good. Not being known as students getting mugged all the time and losing their phones. It's a bad reputation. I don't think you can be fully prepared for anything in life. Mentally, I wasn't because the freedom you get, you go from high school where teachers want to see your notebooks and what you're doing with your assignments and they're checking up on you. It's, it's, it's hard to adjust from the, the, the high school pattern. I was, not, I was not prepared for that. My mom always disciplined my siblings and I made us do homework for long hours after school, so I really was into the routine. I was from a, a boarding school, so I can't say that I struggled to go into a different place and staying alone, so yes, I was more than ready. But in my second time coming back to university, I think I was, when I was coming to UJ. Going to Forte when I was 21, I was at an age where I could manage myself, I could manage my time, I could manage my emotions, I could manage my finances. No 18 year old, like very few in fact, maybe some can, but very few 18 year olds can handle themselves like that. If they do, I God bless their parents. First year students have to be aware of the effects that a new and strange environment can have on them. Among these challenges are high dropout and failure rates. Despite the increase in enrollment for students across races since 2005, the Council on Higher Education reported that the completion rates continue to be lower for African and colored students. Only about one in four students in contact institutions, excluding UNISA, graduate in regulation time. For example, three years for a three-year degree. Only 48% of contact students graduate within five years. 
Access, success and completion rates continue to be racially skewed, with white completion rates being on average 50% higher than African rates. This may in part be because ill-prepared students are entering universities with very different histories and prior education experiences, and that influences their ability to settle into university. High school didn't prepare me at all for university. In high school, a minimum pass mark was 30%. Come to varsity, it's 50%, something completely different. Right now they teach you to pass, you know. They give you like 20 pass papers, and if you do those 20 pass papers, it means you'll get 100% in your exam. I wish high school would have prepared me better by time management. The high school is not preparing anyone for that. Um, most of us were kind of prepared, overly prepared for when we got to university. So the only problem was with myself because I went there to university, then did other things that I was not even told to do by my past, uh, my, my former teachers. You go in African schools, you're learning body parts of a, of a locust, you know? In the modern world, in varsity, what? It's, well, how is that helpful, you know? The first friends were familiar faces. I came to Varsity with my friend from high school. We did everything together. With friendships, you have to find someone like you. My first year, I didn't have friends. First, second year, um, I randomly walked up to my friend and asked her to be my friend. I was fortunate enough to have friends um, who are much more like family, Abagum. There's a lot of partying going on, there's a lot of drinking going on. So if you're a person of faith and, and a spiritual person, so you're limited a bit, you know, even sexual activity, you know, like, okay, this might get out of hand, so you're limited. So it helps you remain focused on your studies because most people who drop out of varsity are people who are partying too much or people who end up getting pregnant or make someone pregnant and now they have to provide for someone. Oh God, in my head, the only thing that could ring is that if the Lord had not been on my side. It's a marker of identity in a way. Throughout those three years, that was for me because there were days where you want to give up. No matter what you're going through in university, don't forget to pray. You know, faith will make you feel like a mad person at times, eh? I was never stressed to worry, where am I going to go, January? What's happening about me? Like, in a way, I was calm. You know, when I pray to God, I just tell God my deadline, what you know what God January I'm going to an interview and if you have people that make you feel like you belong in this institution you are more comfortable and being comfortable means you can perform better other challenges affecting student experiences at university are university admission processes, degree choices and changes, administration culture, university location, lecturers and lecturing style, and language deficiency. How much do these influence the student experience at university? We expect the administration officers to work simultaneously in a sense that while they're busy punching the system, updating, you know, we expect them to pick up the call. We expect the very same people to attend to the queue. UDJ's administration is quite efficient. Uh, I applaud it because what they did is they split everything up. The people who are doing humanities, they have their own, you know, secretaries and we have our own mechanical secretary, we have our civil secretary, so you get attention quickly and the workload doesn't become too much. So if you have an administrative issue, you got there, you get there, you find a specific person who can help you if you want to see a lecturer and he's not there, the lecturers have secretaries who handle admin stuff on their behalf, so it's quite efficient. The lecturers are fine, just the D UT stuff are really rude and not helpful. Well, some of them. Admin is bad at Forte. It's really bad. You, you spend the whole day at admin. In January, I wanted to have my transcript. So they said I must first pay 120 to get my own paper, my own results. First time the figure for I was really struggling to, to, to adapt. Even when I'm doing presentations, I will speak too fast. Yeah, it's, it's so, but when time goes by, I, 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 I was able to, 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 to get help. But I attended uh, counseling. Senior students who are at a higher level than you, those are like, for me, I quickly learned, you know what, you need to befriend those people and they'll give you good advice because your peers, they just don't know as much as you do. I, I wanted to, 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 to drop out because of, 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 of students are laughing at me and, and struggling to, 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 to speak. But now I'm, I'm, I'm really getting help. I had someone that I knew from back home. She was doing her third year when I was doing my first year. So she was the person that would tell me that, okay, 
if you want to, to proceed or to pass or to succeed, do this, do that, you know. My most enjoyable module was actually chemistry. Financial management. Customary law. Psychology and religious studies. Criminology. My least favorite was... Philosophy. It was modeling. I saw flames in that. That was the worst module ever. Investments management. <laughs> We've been really fortunate because our Faculty of Engineering, we have our own labs where you get um, online resources. But then if they are full, you can always bring your own laptop. There's Wi-Fi, it's easily accessible. There's the library if you need a book. There are people, there are tutors, there's academic centers. Um, I think the university is desperate for more lecture venues because the lecture venues right now, they're becoming old. Sometimes there's a five minute window between lectures and before you finish, the next class wants to come in because they have a test. They need more computer labs because you're living in a world where you need to do research and stuff like that. I like lecturers who are interactive. Is that lecturer who will just come to class and teach you, ask you questions, makes jokes, then you, you feel comfortable. And it was so interactive, Gendlela, that I had never been with my previous university. I know one of my lectures last year was very jokey with us. She was like, she was casual, basically. A boring lecture is that one will just come to class and read for you. If you want to read the textbook, then I might as well sit at home and do that all by myself. If I don't understand something, like I, I always go to, to confront my lectures. Sometimes you find that maybe a student is a quiet student, they're not the type to put their hand up and ask a question. Some lecturers are open to opinions, where some are just like, this is the way I do things, take it or leave it. And that's where they lose off their students already. If you ask a question, they'll be like, oh no, I taught this already, don't ask me this sort of thing. So those ones who are always like, we don't know if they're angry or they're ugly. I had never gotten a, a mark below 80%. And I felt like, you know what, maybe I chose the wrong career. Or maybe I'm not as smart as I think I am. It is not wrong to fail. People fail, it, it's, it's a normal thing. It doesn't start with me, so it won't end with me also. You can fail and you, you learn from your failure. You have to remind yourself why you started in the first place. I suffer from chronic migraines. And part of the reason is because of my stress and anxiety. You know, with me, it happened in the weirdest way because it was late 2012, the year I took a gap year. I can tell myself I'm cool, calm, and collected about an exam tomorrow, but subconsciously there is a stress and anxiety about it, and that forms the migraine, and no matter what, it's never going to go away until I've written the exam. It's something that I did not understand for it to be leading. And I went to the doctor, I got diagnosed on by lip prescription. And to this day, I've never taken a single pill. And the only reason for that was because the pills cost about 500 Rand cash. So they were extremely expensive. I can't afford to let it affect me to a point where you're missing an exam. All I was told, Mna and the perceptions around depression on its own and mental health is that I saw school was abandoned by When I go when go to school was abandoned by but I think f for most of us, I saw school was abandoned I still didn't ask much about like the student affairs division as a school in and even the clinic. I, n I never went to the clinic as a school in. And it hit me that I don't think this man actually realized what's going on with me. He had an older neck, no one stress. And I saw stress, like I am down and out. And luckily I have had the support to be like, you can do this, push through, you'll be fine. I thought of killing myself a couple of times. I just didn't have the courage to do it. I would only attend to like my own depression and And for me, the only thing that I could think of the next best thing, he was not gonna pay for these pills. I need to just connect with a higher power. I just, okay, I have my medication and whatnot, so I, I should have a better handle on things. It will probably happen to a lot of students. This thing is happening to you. Be curious, be inquisitive about it. I think students that feel they don't belong or those that do not actually want to study. When you start to perform well, you start to feel like you belong here because everything seems right. But when you don't perform well, then you feel like, you know, this is not right. I definitely belong here. I belong in varsity, nowhere else. I don't, I don't even think I'm ready to go work because I still want to be here. Imagine if 
first semester of school, it was basically theory, theory only. Second semester, you were focusing on practicals. You were being taken to different kinds of firms, companies, learn how to be an accountant, learn how to do auditing and stuff like that. I've seen many students that have done IT, like they've joined holiday programs and stuff like that. And they've actually been maybe for like a month or so and they've gained so much knowledge when they got back. They have a lot of industry people who come to them and provide them with funding. They should at least help students with placement, you know, because there aren't too many of us. I think for, engine, for mechanical engineering, it's like 65 of us this year. So I think they'll be able to place all of us in internships if they wanted to, but it's like, it's none of their business. In South Africa, the majority of students face financial challenges that affect their ability to access university education. These financial challenges also affect their access to appropriate accommodation, relevant technology, food and transport, among other things. Many students rely on bursaries from the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, which are also not enough to adequately finance their academic journey. Currently, I'm owing NWU. Uh, 17,000. 52,000 something rands in debt. I've been using a loan from ABSA. So I have to pay that money first and then complete. I have to work during the holidays and the money I get, I pay for the interest. Right now it's at a figure of around 135,000 rand. I got funding from NSFAS. So I got this loan from NSFAS, of which I currently owe about 150,000 rand. I was partly funded by NSFAS and partly self-funded. So they paid for my first semester. People say bursaries are a good thing, but when you read the fine print, it's, it's horrible. They're exploiting you. So now I owe NSFAS about, what, 11,000 rand, and I owe 49,000 odd. And I am honestly going to let that simmer there as well. What people don't understand is NSFAS is not a is not a free check, you know, it's like a credit card. We'll pay for accommodation, your school fees, and then once you graduate, you have to pay it back. Every student who feels that their parents cannot afford to pay for their studies should be able to apply, honestly, without even hiding it, you know, without even us having to go and find dead relatives and this and that. The ideal residence for students is on campus. Because it's safe, you can do anything at any time. For example, if you want to study until late, you can go to the library, you wouldn't be worried about transport. There's access to internet on the residences and as well as around campus. I squatted on campus. I did in another residence where I was staying in a TV room. I said he's visited, they said no visitor shall be there for more than four days. They charged me again. And I've got, I think I'm owing the university about four to five thousand rand for a squatter. So I will sit there as if I'm watching soccer with these guys, and then when it's time for them to leave, I will leave with them and come back and sleep on the couch. And then in the morning, around five or six o'clock, I should be awake and playing some music as if I'm watching uh, in a certain channel. For the remainder of the year, I found um, a place to stay outside of campus. And the area was like a bit dangerous. And then this year, I'm staying in a commune with only girls. We were staying with a bunch of guys. Guys are noisy, they're untidy. You have to clean up after them. You have to tell them every now and again that please lower your music, we're trying to study. So it wasn't nice. For me, home was comfortable. And if you can be in a comfortable space during your studies, um, that I could recommend. The first time the Lamba is calling, the first time I experienced Tungamina Valley, not having any money. Breakfast, more vites. Lunch time, more vites. Supper time, more vites. But if you were at home, you would know. If you know exactly what to do. I've never gone without food before. I've never been hungry in campus. You were given this amount of money and you need to be able to budget it for a, B, C, and D. There are some unforeseen expenses which come up, you know, and you have to take the money for food and put it somewhere else. So you find a lot of girls date older men. You find a lot of girls um, just to get by, even without it being about ukugya and money, even with, for studies. Um, they sleep with lecturers for, for to upasa res. 
they'll sleep with the SRC. I think that universities should assist students who come to campus on, a, on an empty stomach. Student Affairs actually offers e -E -E food packs, but students don't know that. The way they do it, it's close to the student center where people buy their food, you know, and they all are in a queue for free lunch. It is just, I think they should just move the place and put it somewhere else where it's not in front of all the students, you know, because now you're, it looks as if y'all are being paraded. In a national revolutionary movement, South African students demonstrated against fee increases in their respective universities. The hashtag fees must fall became a nationally trending topic as tens of thousands of students and citizens alike took to the streets to demand that the government deliver free and equal university education. The message for the institutions and the government was very clear. Things can no longer carry on as they have. If fees are going to fall, what is going to rise? I support it. At first, I didn't participate because I was like, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to protest. That's not me. I 100% support fees must fall. Because some students drop out of university because they, they, they have no means. It is a good campaign. Fees must fall. Because I am one of many students struggling with um, school fees. The movement was really, really great and I think it should continue. So if I multiply 70,000 students with 100 rand per application fee, it gives me 7 million. That's a lot of money. Everyone has the right to education. I mean, it's, it's not a privilege, it's, it's, it's a right. Tuition is expensive, varsity is expensive, books are expensive, accommodation is expensive. Everything about varsity is just so expensive. It's not what it started out as. We shouldn't be hurting um, and harming other people just to you know, get what we want. When you are striking, you're doing it for the betterment of the group that you are in. And if you look at that in the bigger sense, we all belong to the same group because we all are students. Primary and secondary education is a hum, it's a right, it's, you need it. You can't, like most people can't get jobs because they don't have a metric certificate. These must fall thing. And it was so inspiring to see that, you know, it's not just us fighting this fight, it's the country as a whole, the nation as a whole. It's about time that free education becomes possible. I think free education is possible. How? The government can contribute, private sectors can contribute, businesses can contribute, university on its own can make it possible for students. It is possible, it's just that the government does not want to make it possible because there's a lot of shuffling that needs to go on. Can we just get free education? <laughs> university cannot be free. Since it is difficult to talk transformation without discussing race issues in South Africa, the conversation with students quickly turned to experiences of racism, institutional and structural violence at university. In general, everybody experiences some form of racism. You know, in Kule Nayo, in my own head, you know, by now, okay, the white person has the upper hand. People of our generation need to let go of the past that they never lived in. Is it because I'm black? I mean, we need to go over that. Now we're looking at ourselves as victims. We're not living under apartheid now. I hate it. It's a pet peeve. Racism is still here. If you go to East London campus at Forte, there's white people there. I shame, I feel so sorry for those little kids. They are treated like nothing. But they don't use racism as an excuse to get out of things or to get your way. You'd find Zimbabwean and Kenyan and all these other students being segregated from South African students. So, Tina, we got everything and they had to hustle really hard to get anything. The environment here, it doesn't, it, 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 it's resistant to change. We may have the now vice chancellor as a black man and stuff like that, but you know that he doesn't work alone. He, he has a team, he has a team. So the, the team composes of the majority white people. South Africa has transformed, South Africa is still transforming. 80% of the students are black, but the lecturer is only one lecturer in my faculty, I don't know about other faculties, but faculty of, of engineering, faculty of science is predominantly white and the secretaries and other admin workers are black and you're wondering where's the transformation there, you know? The word transformation is a fallacy. <laughs> it's something that we don't talk about. The moment you start mentioning the word transformation, they look at you with that eye of, you are now starting with your nonsense, you are trying to bring trouble and stuff like that here. Transformation, it does not exist. It's just that the level of transformation or the pace of transformation is too slow. 
no we're just given democracy and this constitution that we have to work on it's it's it, it's not transformed what i saw in the past 10 years is not what i see now there is a difference it's all about working together towards transformation if they want to transform the institution of learning transform the curriculum transform the services and apply quota apply gender quota in their intakes and the allocation of funding apply racial quota in their intake and allocation of funding. The parents may be paid the same, but because of the burdens that Tina as black families and black people we have, one of they, they will always have the upper hand. They always have resources allocated for them. Very much privileged, eh? Very, very much privileged. Even like with the Freeze Mass 4 movement, you can see from the reaction of white people when they say, no, you guys, if you can't afford certain fees, then don't come to VIT. Comments like that, like why should I be held back from going to one of the one of the best universities in South Africa because I can't afford it? And why are you so relaxed about the fact that I can't afford to go to VIT, but I want to go to VIT? Why cater for white students? Why can't I have the privilege to be taught in my own language? Because I understand better in Sotswana than English. It's not my home language. I've always wondered, would it not have helped us as a black nation if we had our classes in this class. Now then, if a university uses a certain language which is different, let's say Zulu, Kosa, or whatever it may be, it makes it difficult for other students that want to enroll into university to come and actually access that. There is another lecture who is white. If a black person goes to his office, uh, maybe consulting, uh, if you speak wrong English, you are going to be having a very big problem. So you have to do everything according to a white man's standard. If that white man can give me that attitude, I was going to deal with him directly. Then I would just give him the attitude. They shouldn't just cater for just um, English and Afrikaans speaking, you know? It's fair enough to say that English should be the medium language. We don't speak English properly since well English is not our mother tongue. They spoke English all their lives, so that it's easy for them to complain with lecturers, it's easy for them to, to complete certain tasks. But if I come from a Zulu home and I was taught everything in Zulu, now I go, to I go to UCT, now I have to learn English. This is a foreign language to me. At the University of Pretoria, for example, there are some curriculums which are offered in Afrikaans. In the Afrikaans class, they are given extra material, like past papers and proper scopes, whereas in the English um, lecture, they are given like basic stuff. So what's the percentage of the population in the country of people who went to Afrikaans high schools? The majority of people in high schools, you go to Kasi high schools, they do Zulu as a home language or suits you, you know, that's the majority. Shouldn't you be having that instead? Throughout their journey, the students have experienced regrets, celebrated achievements, and identified some coping mechanisms and strategies that have worked for them along the way. We asked them what lessons they have learned and how they create opportunities and strive for success in the face of difficulty. What advice would they give to younger students to help them better prepare and survive the system? Does their story have a happy ending? University is a place where you find yourself because you're now in transition from a teenager to a young adult. You can either make it or break it. Those are the words I would have told myself and yeah. I'd say strip away everything that you think you know. It's survival of the fittest. Focus more on building yourself. Never give up. Do it for yourself. This is your own race. Do it at your own pace. If I were to do it again, yes, I'd do my undergrad at the Northwest University, but I'd do my honors somewhere else. I would still be in UJ, studying the same course. I wouldn't have come here, I would have been at any university except for this one. I think I would change my study routine. I think I have seen enough of the lecture venues. Only God knows how long <laughs> I have at university. I'm waiting to graduate. I got an internship starting in March, so I'll have to juggle both studying and working at the same time. And I thank my supportive friends. My mother. My parents. My supervisor, my honours supervisor. He was also my junior lecturer. Myself and my family for the support that they've given me throughout and for believing in me. My biggest achievement so far is graduating yes because right now I'm working I have internship programs so success is being happy with why with what you have while you pursue all that you want it's not easy but it's worth it
Make a sound, action, gesture or face that best expresses your experience of university. Ah! I hope that's visible. <laughs> I'm in the struggle for students. Woo! Oh my goodness. University. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, yeah. hey, that's it. Yeah. <laughs>